Um, wow. On a beautiful afternoon. Thank you for coming on a Friday. Uh, thrilled to have you all here for um, one of our first in-person sessions. Um, uh, I'm Ann Basting. I'm the director for the Center for 21st Century Studies coming in the uh, heels after Richard Grusin, who will be one of our, our first speaker today. Very excited for that. Um, I want to take a second and thank the whole team um, who makes all these events possible. Uh, Nicole Welk Yeager, our deputy director, who um, really is like Atlas lifting the world. <laughs> um, we have um, Joshua, thank you, and Randolph, who was running um, registration outside, uh, Elena and Ren, and am I forgetting any of the, and Bridget. Um, we have a lot of uh, Nicole manages and coordinates an incredible team of students, um, fellows who are helping with all of our programming. Um, I also wanted to start, before we start, um, acknowledge that in Milwaukee, we are on the traditional lands of the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk, the Menominee homelands, along the southwest shores of Michigami, which is North America's largest system of freshwater lakes, where the uh, Milwaukee the Menominee and the Kinnikinnick rivers meet. And the more I come to understand this and value it, um, we are in a very special place where all these waters come together. Um, and where the people of, of Wisconsin's sovereign Anishinaabe, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Oneida, and Mohican nations remain vitally present. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Um, I. Uh, I'm going to introduce, we're going to have um, presentations, short presentations from each of the panelists first, and then we'll have a dialogue facilitated by Nicole. Um, I get the great pleasure of bringing up my colleague, uh, Jason Puskar um, from English um, to introduce Richard Grusin. Um, I also want to take a moment and say that you can catch Jason tomorrow at the Milwaukee Public Museum from 11.30 to 1.30, um, doing a, a talk on 150 years of the QWERTY keyboard, which is very much in keeping with his forthcoming book uh, called The Switch, an on and off history of the digital human. Am I getting that right? Is that the final title? Final as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> Coming out this year, University of Minnesota Press. Thank you, Jason. All right, thank you all. Just to one clarification, it's actually the same talk at 11.30 and 1.30, so you don't have to stay for two hours. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to introduce Richard Grusin, my colleague in English here. Um, uh, Richard is the author of four books, the editor of six more, the author of many articles on a wide range of different topics, um, and I'm sure many of the people here at UWM are familiar with them. Um, I've known Richard since his arrival in 2010, and I've appreciated him ever since as a model of wide ranging, creative and curious scholarship. And um, uh, uh, especially as someone who started off his career working more in kind of literary and cultural studies and has moved gradually, but mostly completely to um, media studies, new media studies, um, and even science studies. And um, uh, that, uh, example for me was very important because I used to work more on novels, poems, and plays, and I now work more on math and machines and typewriters. And, um, uh, you know, in retrospect, I can see that Richard's example is one of the things that emboldened me to be able to do that. Um, I think influence is one of those things that really you can only discern retrospectively, right? It's a little bit like getting COVID, getting influenced, right? You don't, you don't really know you're getting it when it's happening. <laughs> Right. It's later you look back, they oh, that's where I got it. <laughs> right? And I think that one of the things that I most appreciate about Richard is not just his his scholarship um, as a as a writer, but what he accomplished here at C21, um, putting together for each of those six edited volumes a conference where he brought in really world-renowned academics, critics, thinkers, artists, intellectuals uh, to bring to UWM and exposed to young scholars at that point, like me, uh, uh, an entire world that I knew nothing about. And it's really through um, Richard's work since 2010 here at C21 
that I caught the bug that has led to the second half of my career. So I'm grateful for that, Richard. Thank you for it. I want to say a few words just quickly about the shape of Richard's career before he introduces um, what is a new topic for me, arboreal humanities, um, because Richard is very good at introducing new topics. I think we all know Richard as a, a field leading figure in media studies and new media. Uh, but you may know, you may not know that before his 1999 um, groundbreaking work, remediation, remediations, he was, um, his, his next book was actually um, on national parks. And before that, his first book was actually on uh, transcendentalism and biblical hermeneutics, which he keeps pretty quiet, I've noticed. <laughs> uh, so this is a guy who we, I think, all know in terms of new media, the digital computers, right? But he is a really wide ranging American studies scholar and a, a, a critic of uh, American culture. And he has engaged his work on mediation has been creatively engaged across the board with handwriting, affect theory, 9-11, right? As well as the internet and the digital and, and computers and things you might, you might expect more. And so I really appreciate that breadth and I expect us to see a little bit more of it today uh, with the arboreal humanities. Given the capaciousness of Richard's career, I, I hope, I think, that the arboreal humanities might encompass a little bit of some of those earlier works on American Romanticism and nature with a capital N, because even though Richard's critique of nature with a capital N was to not leave much of it intact, to reveal it as culture. Um, but one of the other things I really admire about Richard's work is that when he turns the laser beam of critique on a subject, he doesn't burn a hole in it. He warms it up and you can come out the other side with new ways to appreciate it. And I think that that's a very valuable skill uh, in any critic. So um, I'm very interested to hear what he has to say about arboreal humanities today. His title is Arboreal Infrastructures, Trees, Technics, Mediation. So I give you a man who has always been able to see both the forest and the trees, Richard Bruce. <laughs> So where, what button do I press, Joshua? I'll oh, just press the arrow to move forward. Um, let me just share this, the slides real quick and we'll be in good shape. And then here, just give me a, just the forward arrow. Yep, okay. I should do it. Wait a minute. Go to the next slide. This is not, oh fuck. <laughs> okay, I that's the wrong slide, Joe. Um, <laughs> but all the slides that I want are in there. So this this is a part of a. <laughs> this talk is not about arboreal infrastructure. Uh, this talk is about arboreal humanities, which is a piece of this arboreal infrastructure talk. So. Um, shit. I don't know. I'm not sure how that happened. I suppose we. Should have run through that. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> anyway, thank you, Jason, for that uh, really lovely introduction. Um, this is a this is a real full circle moment for me when I came to UWM at, to direct C twenty one in two thousand ten. The first semester I was here, I gave an inaugural lecture in this room on the future of twenty first century studies, and um, we tried to make that future happen. Um, and we did some some of it, I think. Anyway, uh, there's still a long future ahead. And I think Ant's done a really lovely job of, as well of beginning to reimagine uh, that future as we now enter the third decade of, um, of this century. Um, and I want to thank Ann for inviting me and give me this opportunity. Um, for those of you who don't know, I don't know, I'm retiring uh, at the end of this semester. And um, going to be an active grandfather and an environmental activist, I think. Uh, so uh, it'll be a good life um, after UWM. But I'm really grateful uh, to this place for everything I learned here. And actually, I became an activist at UWM. Uh, Lane and I were spent a, a good deal of time in 2011 in Madison uh, at the beginning of the destruction of 
this university system that um, is still st still standing uh, despite the best efforts of our politics. Anyway, um, so you can take uh, the boy out of the uh, old format of paper reading, but you can't take uh, that old format out of the boy. So I'm going to read a short paper uh, about our boil humanities. So trees are in the air these days. Deforestation is widely recognized as a major contributor to climate change. Professors of forestry and forest ecology tell us how trees communicate with one another, as well as laying out the complex interdependency of trees, plants, and fungi. And let's see if I can find the slide. That's the one I want. Okay, good. Contemporary writers publish large sweeping novels about humanity uh, from an arboreal perspective, and artists create projects that dramatize the ecological implications of deforestation or collaborate with trees as artistic agents and media. But scientific, literary, and artistic interest in trees is not a new phenomenon. Many indigenous peoples have complex legends, traditions, and practices involving trees as non-human people. From the classical era on, myths and stories about people turning into trees or vice versa have inspired numerous works of literary and visual arts. Trees have long been an important object of study for natural history, and the development of lumbering as a crucial extractive industry for capitalism and settler colonialism has generated the development of forestry and forest conservation as a way to maximize timber production on the one hand and to protect, if not preserve, forests from overwhelming devastation on the other. In light of this upsurge of interest in trees, I've begun along with some students and colleagues, my students and some colleagues across the country, uh, to undertake the project of thinking what it would mean to pursue an arboreal humanities. What do I mean by this term? I begin by defining arboreal humanities as a subset of the environmental humanities. Like environmental humanities, whose urgency is intensified by global crises of climate change, environmental injustice, and other forms of slow violence, arboreal humanities has become more pressing because of the intensification of extractive practices like clear cutting and deforestation. especially but not exclusively as a result of the negative impacts of these practices on global warming. Both environmental and arboreal humanities are motivated by ecological and political activism. Each shares a commitment to use humanities texts and methodologies to raise awareness of the historical roots, present day circumstances, and future dangers of climate change in the era of the Anthropocene, uh, or as Donna Haraway and uh, Anna Singh like to call it the plantation scene. Uh, <clears throat> and both seek to practice an interdisciplinary, both arboreal and environmental humanities, seek to practice an interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary methodology that would overturn the academic divide between humanities and natural sciences, or human and natural sciences even more broadly. But trees hold a particularly interesting place in the human imagination not only because of the wide distribution of forests across most of the planet's biospheres, but also because of their distinctive individuality in comparison to many other plants. Botanist Francis Halle describes their, quote, mixture of unchanging presence, yet complete otherness, noting that, he continues, we are unable to keep from investing trees with human emotions and human language, their branches become hands, their crowns heads, their roots feet. We see in trees both friendly and menacing moods, and we believe them capable of suffering if we wound them. But the connection between humans and trees is not simply a case of anthropomorphism. Um, and as I argue in the longer version of this paper, but don't really get to, I think, here, um, I'm really interested in reversing that and thinking not about how uh, trees are like humans, but about how humans are like trees. And I think we'll talk about that some in the conversation. 
and both, um, oops, sorry. So the connection between them is not simply a case of anthropomorphism as Richard Powers notes in a sentence that recurs three times in his epic arboreal novel, The Overstory. Yeah. Um, you and the tree in your backyard come from a common ancestor. One reason we invest trees with human emotions and language is that we have evolved from the same ancestral family. Howard's novel both anchors and has helped to establish the interdisciplinary canon of arboreal humanities. I mean, he's not the only novel, contemporary novel that does that, but it's really be, been the most prominent, I would say, so far. Um, and then, so he, his novel helped to establish this interdisciplinary canon of arboreal humanities, broadly defined to include all forms of art, literature, science, and culture that concern themselves with trees and forests, similar to how over the past three decades, environmental humanities has created a new canon out of cultural, scientific, and medial representations of nature and the environment. Indeed, once we be begin looking, we discover that Western literature is replete with trees, as are paintings, some of which depict trees as their central subjects, while others portray them as omnipresent features of the painted landscape. Uh, the arboreal humanities has a well-forested historical canon of verbal and visual representations, which has become increasingly visible in the 21st century. I mean, I've just discovered recently through a Edvard Munch Facebook group that that Munch was an amazing tree painter. I mean, we know him for the screen, but uh, he painted trees almost as often as he painted people. It's a pretty phenomenal. Human fascination with trees also derives from their ubiquity in our daily lives. The vital importance of wood in providing raw materials for human dwellings and other social and technical infrastructures. As dendroclimatologist, as dendroclimatologist Valerie Trouet writes, the many archeological and historical wood remnants, buildings, water wells, artifacts, charcoal, tree stumps, represent only a fraction of the ways in which we've leveraged this unparalleled natural resource. Wood has been used to make weapons for hunting and warfare, to make tools, furniture, sports equipment, woodblock, printing, and paper, even making possible the written word as you see it on the, in this very book today, she writes. Wood was the primary source of energy, both in homes and in industry, up until the Industrial Revolution and the pervasion of fossil fuels. It's no exaggeration to say that human civilization as we know it is founded on trees. Roland Enos makes a similar point in his recent book, The Age of Wood, which narrates human interaction with trees and wood starting as far back as pre-human primates. Not only is wood made up the major portion of human infrastructure through the course of our history, but humans are intertwined with trees in ways we do not always fully acknowledge. Indeed, more than a hundred years ago, anatomist Graf Grafton Elliott Smith proposed that primate evolution was accelerated by adaptation to arboreal life, which fostered the development of perspectival sight over smell, complex depth perception, and the grasping abilities of feet and hands. Enos develops what anthropologists first called the arboreal theory in further detail, drawing on recent work in anthropology and cognitive science to show how some of the key evolutionary characteristics that distinguish humans from other species developed from arboreal primates. In this light, it might not be overstating the case to think of the human reliance on wood, for example, as an, as an instance of what we could call the coevolution of humans, or even the humanities and trees. As an academic concern, our boil humanities does not emerge directly from the broader enterprise of environmental humanities, but branches out from what's come to be known fairly recently now as plant theory. Natasha Myers has described what she calls the plant turn, 
a recent swerve in attention to the fascinating lives of plants among philosophers, anthropologists, popular science writers, and their widely distributed electronically mediated publics. Although I don't have the time for a full discussion of this exciting turn to plants, and didn't in the longer paper either, if we're fully to understand the arboreal humanities, it is important to lay out a few of its recurrent claims. Plant theorists like Emmanuel Kocha, Michael Martyr, Jeffrey Needlin, and Matthew Hall have underscored the marginalization or exclusion of plants from the Western philosophical tradition. Plants are often placed at the bottom of a hierarchy of living organisms because of their lack, variously, of a soul or the ability to move or feelings or sensation. Plant theorists contrast this devaluation with recent philosophical revaluation of animals, reflected in the development over the past few decades of animal studies as an interdisciplinary academic field of research. The decentering of the human and animal studies, plant theorists argue, mainly extends some of the privileges of humans to animals, leaving the ontological dualism between animal and plant life uh, for human and non or human and non-human life firmly in place. Um, so, in other words, by uh, animal studies, animal theories sees animals as being like humans, but still then sort of have just kind of shifted the, the line. Plants are still seen as, in a sense, other or subordinate. The recent turn to plants in the popular and scholarly imagination has been intensified by the work of indigenous authors whose traditions, unlike those predominant in the Western world, have long treated plants like human and non-human animals as persons. Shaman Davi Kopanawa, in collaboration with anthropologist Bruce Albert, has powerfully articulated the Yanomami belief that the forest is alive, but is being threatened by the destructive actions of white people. Anishinaabe scientists like Robin Wall Kimmerer and Mary Genius have written brilliantly on the interconnections of native cosmologies with Western science. And Mary Genius has a UWM history as well, interestingly. Um, Kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass, which narrates in part the difficulties she encountered as an indigenous woman in her efforts to integrate Western science and Anishinaabe traditional knowledge, has become something of a bestseller and is a regularly assigned reading on college and university syllabi across the curriculum. Natural scientists like Mancuso Halle, Daniel Shamovitz, and others have similarly criticized the overwhelming prejudice of the biological sciences in favor of animals. In their entreaties for us to pay increased attention to the intelligence of plants, these scientists have worked tirelessly to overcome what they characterize as plant blindness in Western culture and science the failure to see plants in relentlessly focusing on human and animal being. Natural scientists often cite as evidence for the importance of plants, the fact that they make up over 80% of the earth's biomass, while animals make up less than one half a percent. As if to demonstrate their point about plant blindness, almost every graphic I've found to illustrate <coughs> Almost every graphic I've found to illustrate the biomass of plants, even those in articles with headlines like plants are the world's dominant life form, is accompanied by detailed breakdown of this 0.5% biomass of animals. You can see uh, down in the purple. Um, while plants are lumped together into a single undifferentiated category. The more complex differentiation of animal life in these charts ironically reproduces one of the key features distinguishing animals from plants, how animals have evolved by differentiating the basic functions of life, like cognition, perception, nutrition, digestion, waste, and reproduction, and distributing these functions to different organs. These organs cannot be divided from the rest of the animal. Without a brain, heart, or lungs, for example, an animal cannot continue to live. 
In plants, as Mancuso and Alessandro Viola tell us, these vital functions are distributed throughout the leaves, stems, and roots. If part of a plant is removed, new growth will replace it. Our body, they write, really is indivisible. If we're cut in half, the two halves can't live separately. They die. But if we cut a plant in half, the two parts can still live independently for the simple reason that a plant isn't an individual. Animals like us are in that sense literally individuals. They cannot, we cannot be divided and survive. Plants, on the other hand, can be seen as Deleuzean individuals, multiply divisible beings that generate new growth, new individuals when they are split into two or more parts. In fact, the right way to think about a tree, a cactus, or a shrub, Mancuso and Viola Wright, is not to compare it to a human being or any other animal, but to picture it as a colony. A tree is much more like a colony of bees or ants than an individual animal. Whether understood as a colony or a network, individual trees are infrastructural elements of the larger colony or community of mycorrhizal networks that taken together make up a stand or a forest. If plants make up then more than 80% of the Earth's biomass, trees make up the largest part of that plant biomass. Almost anything true of plants is also true of trees, although the reverse is not always the case. The coevolution of humans and trees is in some sense only a special case of the coevolution of plant and animal life on the planet. Mancuso, Cocha, and others remind us that the oxygen which animals breathe has been produced by plants and trees, without which there would be no animal life on Earth as we know it. Understanding plants, Mancuso and Viola Wright is becoming more and more important. They enabled our coming into existence on earth through photosynthesis, creating the oxygen that made animal life possible. And today we still depend on them for our survival. They're at the base of the food chain. They're also the origin of energy sources, fossil fuels that have sustained our civilization for thousands of years. Emitting as a byproduct of photosynthesis, the oxygen that animals need to live, plants make animal life on earth possible. If all animal species were to disappear, plant life would continue without very much change. I mean, there are a few plants that are dependent on a kind of symbiotic relationship with animals, particularly with insects. Um, but if all plant life were to disappear, animals would soon follow them into extinction. There'd be no atmosphere or oxygen for them to breathe. While human and non-human animals are dependent on plant life for their continued existence, this dependence is not mutual, but asymmetric. As Powers imagined repeatedly in the overstory, when humans are gone, plants and trees will get on just fine without us as they did before we primates came down from our arboreal homes. So within our boil, humanities is one which asks us to imagine the non-existence of humans, at least as part of its project. I wonder if it would make more sense to talk about an arboreal non-humanities, in which non-humans like trees and plants, rather than or in partnership with humans, take center stage. And this is something we can talk about along with other things in the conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Richard, for that thought-provoking talk. And I look forward to having the conversation uh, at the end of the two other speakers. I am thrilled today to get the chance to introduce you all to our next speaker, Meg Wilson, who is a graduate student in art and art history at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also an associate of the Center for Culture, History, and Environment. Their research and practice include queer feminist ecological artwork, photography, sculpture, and video. 
Meg's most recent work considers care for plant others and a shift to engaging with plant preferences. Their work is held in collection at the Archive of Documentary Arts at Duke University, and their photography has been exhibited and published widely, including in Time Magazine, Oxford American, Appalachian Reckoning, Still <coughs> the Journal, and Sewn in the Stars, Planting by the Signs. So please join me in welcoming Meg Wilson. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. I'm also going to read off my paper. Thank you so much for the invitation to present my current work and to participate in the roundtable discussion. Thank you, um, C21, for bringing me here. Um, I am a, I'm going to check and make sure this, where do I point it? Okay. Share the screen. Great. I am a second year graduate student at UW-Madison. I'm in two programs. I'm in the uh, MFA in studio art in the 4D area, which is time-based and performance art. Um, and I'm also in the art history program studying visual culture studies. Today I'm presenting my recent installation, Magenta is our favorite flavor. The work involves two parts. First, an ongoing enactment of unsettling queer ecological care on the street, attending to tree preferences and our obligations to trees as our plant others with whom we are already in unequal relation. The second part of the work is a translation of plant preferences into an aesthetic installation in a gallery. What you see here is a vignette from the installation a honey locust seed germination table in front of the installation's focal point, a large wall of magenta. I first bring us to the ground where body meets dirt meets sidewalk, where our bodies, human and tree, meet, or at least one of the places that we meet and mingle at a small hole through the sidewalk, sunlight above, compacted anthroposols below. I begin here with dirt fungus, seeds, before following the lines in the bark up the trunk to the leaves, which will also fall down to this meeting place. These isolated trees taken as resource are planted out in the sidewalk for their aesthetic potential and to capture their worlding work as ecosystem services. Attending to tree preferences as unsettling care work in this specific context means recognizing the multi-species relation of tree, lichen, soil fungus, reaching out for other trees that are not there, and human and non-human animal, animals that make up the assemblage of tree in the sidewalk and to the plant actions in plant time that trees constantly work to try to enliven their own worlds. Here you see the tree's leaves dropped to feed their feet intercepted by impermeable surface. I work to relate to trees rather than as a resource, as more than human members of the public deserving attention and extravagant care. The research recognizes the historical presence present of violence toward human and more than human alike in systems that are built on treating land as resource, on constant accumulation, and on perpetuating the future of that system. Queer ecological care work insists that the way things are right now is not good enough for us, human and more than human, and should not be sustained, but rather changed. So I attempt to attend to trees and their preferences, although the limits of empathy and understanding across human plant relations means that I'm speculating about tree preferences based on research into tree senses, and based on observing the tree's expressions in their world. The tree preferences that I'm working with presently are a tree's preference to reproduce themselves, the preference to keep their dropped leaves in order to feed their feet, protect and grow their soil community, and their preference for their favorite flavor of light, which is not green, but its opposition, magenta. The first preference for reproduction is thwarted constantly for sidewalk trees. 
The aesthetic requirement of the isolated tree on the street means that the self-sown offspring are killed. Here I have taken two offspring that sprouted under the parent tree, or possibly the tree's close clone, as honey locusts can be spontaneously self-fertile, and transplanted them in a location where they won't be cut or sprayed. The second preference I'm working with is to help the trees keep their dropped leaves and branches as sources of nutrients for their soil biome. Here I'm practicing my artwork. Last autumn, it looks like a lot of raking of leaves <laughs> off of uh, the sidewalk and asphalt. The collected leaves are currently piled and composting. Once they've reduced in size and they're not at risk of washing down the gutter to, um, to the lakes or being leaf blown away, I will return them to the tree's soil community. And finally, I spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about tree's favorite flavor, magenta. Here you see a tree in summer, leaves out, photosynthesizing sunlight and atmospheric carbon into the sugars and starches that make up the tree's body that are turned into more leaves, which fall and feed the soil community. In my most recent gallery installation, an aesthetic interpretation of the work I do outdoors with and for the trees into a haptic experience for gallery visitors, I piled wet composting leaves in the corners, set up a seed germinating table with instructions for participating in the tree's reproductive process, and turned the world magenta with both paint and light an attempt to shift from the anthropocentric view looking at the tree and toward a view outward from the position of the tree. The wall piece contextualizes my attention to magenta as the tree's favorite flavor, and I'll read it to you now. The world making of isolated sidewalk trees falls sloppily, spills over edges, seeps out seams, ruptures the bounds of the tree's allotted space and is in the entirety of its exuberance energized by magenta. In the warm months, the sidewalk trees lap up sunlight and swallow air, all their verdant tongues wagging out the tips of their branches. All day long, leaves turn light waves into sugars and world worlds, their own world of root and soil and spread and our world dependent on taking their exhalation as our inhalation. Trees drink in the visible light spectrum to make the sugars that build their bodies. The tree has a favorite flavor of light and it is not green. Their leaves drool the green light waves off and those flow away into our eyes. While we see green, trees are lapping up waves of red and blue light. They are built and build the world from magenta. Magenta sugar flows down the tree's body to feed their soil. Magenta sugar becomes wood seed leaf Seed and leaf are pushed to fall off to the ground. Leaves to feed the feet, seed to perpetuate liveliness. Attending to tree preferences for world making in the same spaces you inhabit asks you to consider the tree as your plant other and feel your implication in the messiness of the sidewalk tree. Their worlds are made small by their isolated planting out and the removal of the products of their labor. How can you enact care for them to create possibility? The work attends to the following speculations. Trees have sensorial life outside of straight time, more complex than we understand. Trees constantly enact their preferences for making their own worlds for themselves. Trees make leaves for themselves and their soil. They should get to keep them. We are obligated to our plant others in the settler colonial campus colony that currently configures this place and that continually pre prevents their world making to perpetuate its own future. The isolated tree is cut off from its naturally occurring multi-species support and trees have a favorite flavor and that is magenta. The germination table in the installation was an opportunity for interaction with the tree's preferences by participating in the role of the mammal in seed germination. This tree drops their seeds yearly, but sidewalk trees are constantly thwarted by efforts to maintain a tidy street aesthetic. These seeds have a hard exterior shell that has to be mechanically fractured by chewing if an animal eats the sweet pod or by nicking with tools in the case of the germination table. 
Participating in this way with the tree's life processes is an opportunity to feel and enact implication in the life of the sidewalk tree. I conclude by bringing us back to the soil. It's important wriggling liveliness and the messy piles of leaf litter that are always an aesthetic question on the sidewalk and the street as much as in the corners of a gallery. And my conclusion that attending to them and to their trees is also a question of speculative ethics in human and more than human relations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg, for that really interesting discussion. And I'm really excited for the conversation um, that will happen, which might not, which might be a little shorter than anticipated, which is totally fine because we will have some more time to talk about arboreal humanities, um, what this could mean uh, as, as a field of study um, launched by, by Richard's talk earlier today. Um, I have the, um, the great pleasure of introducing Vernon Michigan Altman. Uh, he is of the Miami and Potawatomi nationhood, originating within the Great Lakes Territory. He is a father, husband, grandfather, Wei, or traditional namer, teacher, and Ashinabe, with over 30 years of experience in traditional ecological knowledge and land based research methods. He is currently the elder in residence at the University of Wisconsin Milwaukee. And if you are here at UWM, you may have seen him over at the fire circle recently, the last few weeks uh, with the, the, the sugar, um, maple sugaring and sugar bushing techniques. So um, without, um, so he will be sharing about traditional Ashinabic philosophy and how this connection and relationship has been nurtured, maintained and understood for millennia on this land known as Turtle Island. So thank you so much, Michigan. Sounds like a lot. Abuju and then way magna dog, Mishike and go. Minoa, Mishike and all them, Mishike and a shang of mama, my key is Naka dig, Minoa, Mikanakum is sing, is Naka de Oma, Mama key. So this place called Turtle Island is where I originate and uh, uh, I'm known as Turtle. I am also of the Turtle clan. I come from a place called Bacchusnaw Territory over on the Michigan Ontario border. It's where I grew up <clears throat> and uh, hung out with a lot of turtles, actually. Um, but I wanted to, uh, you know, yesterday I was out talking to the uh, <clears throat> Dominican uh, Catholics over in the scene, <clears throat> and I talked about shape shifting. The fact that I look like I'm five six or something like that. I'm really like six seven. So I, I, I shape shifted to look a little shorter so I didn't look so intimidating to them. But today it's difficult to become a tree. But I'll try to speak a little bit on their behalf, <clears throat> just with some of the experiences I've had. So we got. I'm gonna have to read some of this because I, I just whipped this together last night. So we have Matiguk. And then away Maganuk and, and then away Maganuk. So the trees are our relatives with regards to this gigantic systemic family that we interact with on a daily basis and we have for, for millennia. Uh, you know, with regards to the the sun, the moon, the earth, the stars, the wind, rain, snow, mosquitoes even. Those things that like to, to bite you when you're trying to use your fishing pole. <clears throat> Those are our relatives. And uh, we try to maintain that philosophy throughout our earth walk here on Mother Earth. How do we flick this? Do I got to do this? Which button? One of these? Yep. Uh, so these beings, they have identities, 
we have names for them. Uh, some of them are, have different names, like uh, many different names, not just the ones that are here. So here specifically, we have an anoptic, which is basically a sugar maple. And then we have a jungle biwatic, and then a kin, a kikonduk. And these beings all come from this, they're a nation. We, we consider them a nation, a tree nation. And here's a a bark lodge in my home community. And this is where we spend a lot of time within the, it's almost like being in the walls and the inside of a tree kind of thing. So that's, uh, those are, those are, el that's elm bark. And it, they came all the way from Ohio down to my community in the <clears throat> lower Ontario. Just some examples of, of our relationship with the trees and, uh, you know, I, I, it, so it's a personal relationship. I, I, I'm talking way over here. Can you, you can, can you still hear me? Okay. Okay, cool. So anyway, we, we have this personal relationship with these beings. So when somebody chainsaws a tree down or takes a machine and just kind of shreds it along the side of the highway, we can feel that. And... I don't know who coined the phrase, don't take it personal, but that occurs regularly for indigenous folks here on Turtle Island. Whether every every one of them know or not, it, it is a fact. <laughs> so here's a couple of examples of uh, Mitigug, Mitigug, some of these little trees. Over here we have a, this is Matoro Swan. This is a, a they're made out of willows. And uh, as you see, these, these willows regenerate. And that's one of the reasons we use willow trees because they stay, stay alive during the duration of our um, ceremonies we have within that lodge. So I also went out to um, uh, out by Dubuque, Iowa, and we put up a, a lodge over at a Catholic farm there. And, we brought in a whole bunch of Catholic folks from around the U.S. And then here's another example of uh, our relationship with the trees and, and why we maintain a personal relationship. These are a couple examples of, of Otewaeganag. So over there, this, as you can see, the 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 there's numbering on there. So we keep track of and the orientation of how these beings are set, uh, situated. So this one here is like going to be a whole, this is a basswood. We say we go, we go botic. And that one over there is we wasapic, which is uh, that's used with birch. And it's also harvested at a certain time of the year so that it's in a, uh, a male um, state. And then it's like female in the summer. So this is basswood. That's what they used to make water drums out of it, uh, originally. Then we have baka, a, a drumstick also uh, made out of white ash. So these are just some uh, uh, examples of the relationship we have. And it's taken and it's utilized with great care, with protocol, with invocation, uh, prayers, songs. We have all these things that we do um, prior to harvesting or prior to requesting these beings to help us for the care that we need to help our communities with to remember the past. So trees also provide mechum, dash, mashkiki, food and medicine. So over here we got zinzabakwat, which is uh what we were making last week and over the last month over here at in front of Merrill Hall in our fire circle. And then we have Oshkitaogan, which is, uh, it's a medicine. I guess some people call it chaga, but it's also used, we call it Oshkitaogan because it's, uh, it holds this new life basically, because it's, uh, uh, we use it for fire. We can make fire with it, like make putting a spark to it with a, with a piece of flint. 
And then we have BB Gay Winneman. We have those uh, fantastic berries there, elderberries. And then we have the Asama Parmasqua B. Mish, which is red willow. And that's what we used for, uh, well, used it for medication long ago for pain. I mean, that's what they make aspirins out of. And then, of course, this is really has antioxidants that, that create a lot of good uh, for your immune system. Oshkitao, uh, and I guess people harvest it for, uh, for a cancer medicine nowadays because of really fine antioxidants as well. And then the sweet stuff is, of course, good eating. That's basically Dr. Evan Larson, my colleague over at University of Wisconsin Platteville, <clears throat> coined it as uh, when you're eating maple syrup or sugar, it's, it's basically eating sunshine because it's through the photosynthesis pulling down the sun. You need the sun to create that. And here we got Waka uh, Aganug and Denaway Magnetuk. So these are our relatives' houses. And the first one is, uh, is a little strange. Muki Munikad Damasi. So it's a, it's actually a beetle, a June bug. It doesn't look like a beetle right there, <laughs> because at in this stage of life they become food for uh, usually pileated woodpeckers and things like that. But I I popped open a an old log and it, and it had like earth inside of it. It was like actually soil. It was black with soil. The, the rotting dead wood inside turned to soil. And these guys like to burrow in there. These June bugs. So they become tasty treats for the pileated woodpeckers and other beings out there. But it's their home as well. They live in the tree. And then we have Benishia and uh, this is a high-rise apartment. <laughs> Hollowed out tree. And we have uh, Megasi or the swamp, which is a bald eagle nest. So the trees are important for all our all our other relatives too. So we're interrelated, just like the doctor was saying. <clears throat> like walk one cake. So these students were out tapping trees this this spring, and this is part of our EQI Eskiga Mizigan, which is our sugar bushing. Uh, we're practicing and sharing some information with regards to this land-based scientific uh, knowledge that we're uh, we're putting out there. Gani mid megwa ga ashi did mitig. So this young lady here is uh, hanging on to that tree. She found a dance partner. <clears throat> we have uh, wild rice inside that thing there. Typically, we'd have a hole in the ground, and you know, then we uh, put up a tarp or something over it. Long ago, they would put up a, a mat and then dance on it, and there would be song and. And of course, when we had song, it was basically singing to the spirits, or that's how we would speak with the spirits, or our beings, our ancient beings that were here, including the trees. So she's hanging on to her, like, or to keep herself steady to dance on that rice. And then over here, we have this young man is stirring it with a, with another item that was made out of a, a tree. So he's he's roasting the wild rice before it goes over here and gets damp. Um, and this is my little guy. Ningosis Bugdana Sama Gishikao. So my little guy here, he's about three years old here, but he's learning how to, we say in our language, we're always exchanging things for good life. We, we seek to be equivalent to the, to the trees and to all the other beings that we share this earth with or our territories with. So we always make an offering of tobacco because it has a great significance with regards to what he was talking about and how vegetation is our essence. That's how our creation story, our philosophy talks about that as well. That was the first plant that was given to the Anishinaabe before being lowered down here to Mother Earth. Samo was gonna stand up and speak on behalf of all the vegetation. 
Pajish Khan. Oh, Ganuk. So we have a couple of teepees in here. These were for homeless people in our community. They had no shelters or anything. So some community members took it in their hands to uh, put a couple of teepees up where these folks could find warmth. We had some wood stoves put in there and uh, some beds, and they, they were great for the summer. So a banjug is the things that we use to stand the teepee up. So uh, they're called lodge poles, of course. And um, again, there's like great care that's taken into harvesting these beings for, you know, sharing. There's always, again, offerings and ceremonial prayer and song, a lot of times dancing. And uh, the trees are always kept oriented in their life purpose. Uh, so the sun, the creator, and all other beings shine upon us all every day. And this is uh, a Tigomish, an oak tree over in, uh, this was out near Platteville too, with a couple of eagles sitting in. I used to like driving out to the uh, outskirts of Platteville and area. I had, I had some eagle friends that actually lived over there and go visit them regularly and hang out. So trees usually have specific names for a purpose and Matigomish is because of the, uh, the little um, acorns they hang on to. They're like uh, similar to onions. And then here's our prayer tree. Gus Nabagwanimi Matig. So this is our Sundance tree. We we actually uh, <clears throat> it's a long story to this, so I, I won't go too deeply into it. But this is anybody familiar with Sundance? This is our tree that we uh, we we starve ourselves for four days and pray and and dance and sing and uh, put our colorful bindakunjigewa uh, up there, our, our prayer offerings, prayer, prayer cloths, flags, webinasa nishnakade. We dance around this thing for four days, and uh, the eagle dancers will dance there for four nights as well, or they'll stay right on the ground. They, they go without food and water for four days. So we honor the tree in this way, as it is connected to the creator through, the, again, that, that, that full of senses that we talk about. It's, our, uh, it's the center of our universe, basically, and uh, they say it's the backbone of the community. Kishkabag. <laughs> Uh, our Sundance tree. Uh -huh. Meals to go, no them. That's that's it for now. And uh, yeah. So I'm actually going to um, to invite uh, the speakers to come up to the front. Sorry, Michigan. So we're, we're going to sit together here at the front and we'll have a discussion of a few questions uh, related to what connects the talks. Um, and then we'll see if we have some time for those in the audience to be interacting with the conversation as well. So give me one second here. Okay. Oh dear. You know, that might be just be easier for me to hold this. <laughs> Gravity. Um, so I have the pleasure to help facilitate a conversation here between the, the three um, uh, contributors today. And I'll just uh, extend again, a great thank you for uh, these presentations. Uh, really demonstrating some different ways that we can get engage with trees, different disciplines, different uh, cultures and languages as we're approaching trees. Um, and I hope that maybe we can have a conversation of if there is a field of arboreal humanities, what this can look like and how to have this conversation together. 
So I had four main questions and I think I'll just go through those and then open it up to the audience. But um, I sent these ahead of time, but I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully someone read, read them ahead of time. But um, my first question here was that it's very clear that humans have long thought with non-humans in the non-human world to explore and express individual and community values. And that includes with it, it, trees are included in this. So what do each of you think sets trees apart from other kinds of non-humans? I think each of you have gotten into this a little bit, but there's also this issue of plant theory and pushing back on plant theory and thinking with specific trees as well. What um, sets trees apart from other kinds of plants? Um, in the context that I'm working in, the sidewalk plant um, trees have been set apart and isolated for, I think, a number of reasons. One is um, what they mean aesthetically, things like um, naturalizing the paved over landscape by the presence, rootedness of whatever group has paved over and then planted. And then also they mean things about progressivism and sustainability in addition to that because of their longevity. And for some trees, the honey locusts in particular, their ability to withstand deprivation for a long time before succumbing, um, they get planted out rather than annual trees um, Anybody else have? I guess one. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, that's kind of a real scientific question sounding to me, but uh, just generally, I think uh, trees have like earned a, earned a right of respect to be who they are and um, they hibernate just like bears and everything else. And the longevity that we had just heard here is uh, is important because most uh, plants will die and then pop up the next year, but a tree will stay there all winter long and it'll, you know, it'll endure the cold and uh, it'll just keep on ticking. And then evolution occurs and then you got these trees with needles and some trees with needles that fall off. So there's a great... A community out there of trees that we we strive to understand and uh, again when we do our land-based research as indigenous folks it's kind of our way of life in the sense that when we do is we go sit on the land for four days and four nights and go without food and water so that our spirit can connect to that to that being and sometimes we can communicate pretty clearly with them so yeah trees are a uh, are um a giant community that we uh, we just um, try to respect, you know. Anyway, I don't know if I'm rambling, but yeah, I think to answer that question would take a long time. Um, but some of the things that I would highlight that interest me about trees as opposed to other plants or what distinguish them are some of the things that you guys just said about longevity, uh, size uh, is a really important thing. But I I really I'm kind of fascinated with how trees grow and with uh, the fact that they both record their own history within their trunks uh, through tree rings. And the tree rings represent the sort of mark of each year's growth. And they trees grow by accretion. Um, they, they operate, I mean, plants do in a similar way, but they don't record their history in the same way. So trees are super interesting in that they create their own archive. And part of, um, so that's a big part of what I find interesting. I'm also interested in the fact in this longer paper about trees create their own infrastructure because the inside of a tree dies. I mean, the tree, the wood, the tree itself is alive, but the wood at the heart of the tree, that the wood that becomes then the infrastructure that we use to build with and things like that is actually dead. And so trees are these really interesting um, organisms that are both dead and alive. And we have that a little bit with fingernails or things like that. But um, I think for trees, that's a really fascinating uh, aspect. And then uh, also just the way they become homes for so many other creatures. I mean, they are simultaneously individualized 
because they are so big and they, they seem distinct from each other and they are part of these intense symbiotic relationships. Um, you know, I love the woodpecker high rises. Those are great. Yeah. Uh, I had a tree in my backyard here in Shorewood when I lived here. I had no grass. My yard was a patio. And it was a patio actually that was totally being destroyed by the tree roots. I mean, it was not even at all, but I had this really big um, Norway maple there. And uh, I just would sit, I had such a relationship with that tree. And it was not just the tree, but I would watch all the different critters who made their homes there and things like that. So, I mean, those are just some of the things that make, I think, trees different from other forms of non-humans or even forms of plants. But I think one could, yeah, go on a long way. Yeah, they sure do adapt to their environment as well. So they're very resilient in the sense. If you go north, like I, I worked up in northern Manitoba and the uh, the trees, there was mainly burr oak and then some uh, coniferous trees, but the burr oak trees only grew to be about six, seven feet tall. So they, they were very short trees, but they adapted to the environment. But the, the plants, there would only be certain plants there that would grow. So yeah, that's that's what kind of sets trees apart. So yeah, the resiliency, I think, of trees. Yeah, and it's so interesting that this um, the answer to this question, we're thinking scientifically, but we're also thinking socially, how humans are interacting with trees, and maybe that's the humanities aspect of thinking of arboreal humanities, how we orient ourselves to these tree beings, but also thinking about the social infrastructure that trees have with themselves and with other forms of non-human life and um, kind of skirting like between science studies and skirting a little bit into art, like, and, and philosophy and how this comes to how our understanding of the world around us. It's really, um, it's really an incredible what trees can do and open up for us in that conversation. I do think that each of you approach trees differently and you also approach different trees. And we've talked about some very specific trees like Meg with the honey locust um, and Michigan with the sugar maple. Um, does species as an anchor shift your frame or should shift our frame of focus in how um, each of you engage with your work? And might you encourage a different way to classify these non-humans and how we might think of them, um, thinking about species and the specificity? I know we talked about individual trees, generalizable, like uh, trees in an arboreal humanities, does species uh, challenge this at, at all? Yeah, I'll take this to start. Um, one of the things I learned from a blog post about, I don't know, a year ago, am I sent that blog post to you about how trees actually are not a single species in a sense. I mean, it's not like there's a divide between here's birds and here's, but that some trees come from blueberries and some trees come from other things. And that trees are not a, uh, a taxonomical uniform category that trees are actually, I'm trying to, I've been trying to think this through a bit. Trees are ways of being. Um, that is, trees are plants that grow woody stems, for example, or, or that have mostly single stems and so on. But they don't all fall in the same taxonomical category that, uh, you know, that you could where you could divide up other things like cats, right? Or something like that. And so that's, I think, one of the fascinating things is we think the way we think of trees every day, we just think of trees are trees. But in fact, uh, you know, what trees are are different kinds of plants that have adopted similar kind of strategies. And I think that that complicates this whole question of species. And then you know, obviously other ways. I mean, the fact that aspens are this like clonal creature and it looks like there's like a forest of individual aspen trees, but they're actually all just genetically the same offsprings of this of this huge underground root system and so on. I mean, it's just the, the different ways of treeing or being tree, I think is really interesting. And, and that actually, if I can ask a question, um, when you were talking um, about names of trees, I was curious because in um, Robin Wall Kimmer's uh, In Braiding Sweetgrass, she talks about struggling with learning Anishinaabe and how 
it's really a language of verbs, she says, so that like to describe a bay on Lake Michigan is there's not a noun that names bay like we have a noun, but a bay is like water that does certain things with it. And is that true with the tree names? I mean, you had them listed in an English kind of or, you know, Western kind of way. So yeah. this is the name of the tree, like it's a noun. But I was curious if they each had their own. Yeah, basically, tactic. that's their description. Unfortunately, I'm not as deeply uh you know, my uncle would be the person, my late uncle would be the person to answer that question clearly. But uh, in my understanding is, yes, it does describe what the tree actually does. Like in an atig, in our language, in an a is a man. Well, I mean, they translate it to as a man. But when you put that into a tree, it's it's it doesn't mean man. It's it's this being that is it, it's actually opposite of man it's got all this water because women are the keepers of the water and the men are the keepers of the fire so the two go hand in hand there we got this wood inside the tree but then you got the outer cadmium that's running all this water through it so when we say in an a i don't think it means man i think it means some sort of provision keeper or something that has a different responsibility as as you know as in, in the human relationship so yes, they, they, they do. Like I said, Matigamish, it's, yeah. it's named because of its little round acorn. It means this round thing. Mm -hmm. And then Wigwas, I'll take two, you know, the, the, the birch tree. It's the same thing. We, we The birch bark is very important to the Anishinaabeg. It's probably, they, they call it the leader tree, basically, because it's got so much usage. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Meg, do you have a response? Um, I think that species thinking and thinking of trees as individuals and an individual that's part of a species can lean into the sort of hierarchical divisions that you had talked about, Richard, um, between animals and plants as a, a lower form. So in my work, I tend to think of um, the tree and the other species that it is intimately entangled with as an assemblage. Um, and also to look at the behavior of the trees. So for example, um, there's one tree that drops nuts in the parking lot, just an abundance of nuts. And I know that it's the only tree that drops nuts within a one mile radius. And so I don't collect those. I put them to the side so that the squirrel who's part of that um, entanglement can still get that sort of food. Thank you. And and it's thinking a tree as being, and then also thinking about um, just this, this, I like thinking of this interpersonal relationships that you all are bringing out and how it's reflected in language and it's reflected with interactions with the tree, human and non-human animal and non-human plant all being intermingled. And then even uh, going to Haraway's work, compost and dirt and the all being part of this larger cycle that scientists have been tracing for some time, but um, manifests differently in things like writing and poetry and art and how we discuss it in language and philosophy. So it leads me to my next question about how you each attend to communication and trees differently. Um, Richard, you've talked about how people write about trees and are thinking with trees and reimagining human cognition. Uh, Meg, attending to how trees communicate preferences that need attention, colors as flavors, for instance, in Michigan, how trees signal these important interpersonal relationships that are reflected in language um, that we need to learn to recognize. So I ask each of you, what does it mean to take trees seriously um, in this context? Uh, what can this or should this look like uh, if we're going to commit to arboreal humanities? Michigan already said, suggested one way to do that, which was to have an ethical relation with the tree. To, you know, if you're going to use a tree, for example, to ask its permission. Uh, to do that, which is not the Western way of of working, and I think that one uh, one way that we can think about that is, uh, yeah, is in terms of establishing ethical relations with trees. Um, on the language question, again, just because this is in the longer essay, and I'm really interested in this idea. Um, 
a lot of what's happening now in the enthusiasm about trees is that people are emphasizing there's this thing called the wood wide web um, which suggests that trees communicate underground and that the network structure of tree communication is like the network structure of the internet and things like that um, and that the neural the molecules that trees share the carbon and so forth are similar the elements to what we our brain uses and so forth and so there's a lot of like saying, oh, look, trees are just like us. And I think for me to take trees seriously is to realize instead, and I think this is what we need to do, is how we are like trees. And that rather than think of languaging, for example, as or think of language as the product of an individual agent who decides to communicate or to, uh, yeah, to, to make an utterance or something like that, I think to think collectively about languaging as a kind of collaborative practice um, is something that we can see how our language is like uh, tree language. And I think that's the kind of thinking that I'm trying to move towards is to think about how um, to get rid of this idea of the human as this free autonomous agent um, and to emphasize the way in which we function I mean, we function accretively in some ways, just like trees do. I mean, not the same way as trees do, but that I think that there's a lot to learn about uh, how to live, certainly if we start to look at the way trees um, live with one another and so forth. So. Um, I've had a couple of questions about my my work. When people start to consider taking trees in the city and the sidewalk very seriously and thinking they're they may be suffering without um, their resources and out of um, fungal network connection with other trees whether they're information sharing or water sharing because the um, examples that trees water share through the fungal network is really well supported um, and so one of the things the first realization that I had that isolated trees might be suffering is when I was thinking about water sharing between trees and um, the vibration in trees trunks when they don't have enough water and they're trying to move it up and they can't. And I thought of the lonely tree not being able to water share with anyone and how it might be. It's been described um, as screaming. So some people have asked me, what do you want to see a city that doesn't have any trees? And I would like to suggest that it should be possible to imagine instead um, taking trees seriously enough and their preferences and their right to land as seriously as our own and say that over asphalted areas and over pavemented areas and a number of parking garages could be removed rather than jumping to the idea of removing these lonely trees. We can imagine that kind of change. And then um, at a minimum, if trees keep get to keep their leaves, for example, it's going to change the aesthetic of the street and it could look like a lot of mess, but um, liveliness looks like mess. <clears throat> exactly that's that's <laughs> yeah so so you exact you put the words out of my mouth basically it's the same philosophy that i stand by is the sense that these <clears throat> it's like transplanting you know you go get a tree out of the forest you take it away from their family and like separate it and you go put it over there by itself and it's all lonely and it's got nobody to interact with and communicate and socialize with all the things that we do you know we have a diverse community and we like to interact and show each other you know our our our, our um culture you know basically and, and trees I, I think are the same way i think i had tree i mean we're running out of uh old forest or what do you call it old uh, old trees and that's very sad because the trees that we replant are, are nothing like the old growth forest trees so I hope one day we don't run out of old growth because um, that's that's sad. I mean, like transplanting, I, I see people transplant medicines, for instance, like sage and sweetgrass, and and I feel the same way about that. It's it's it's, it's like, I mean, what don't you see? Like especially for indigenous people, our children were taken away and put in residential schools, and look at the stunted growth that came from that. And I think the same thing will happen with trees and and other plants and medicines. 
pretty simple mm -hmm. philosophy, I think. Yeah, and it, it's a, a good reminder that through all of your work, you talk about this interrelationship that we are shaped by trees. Trees are shaped by us and the way that um, we experience the world around us. So it can be informed by by also how trees are, are um, uh, embracing and ex exploring and experiencing the world around them. Um, I do feel like you all kind of answered this last question that I had, which was how do we translate this conclusion that there is this co-evolutionary relationship between humans and trees into action. I see that through um, what you're each talking about, but is there anything else you want to add with how we um, take that, that philosophical conclusion of this co-evolution with trees that we have, that it is like this marker and foundation of, of who we are as humans, how we take that to the next level. And if there isn't any, then I can also open up the questions to the audience. <laughs> I can definitely do that. Does anyone have any questions for the panelists here? And I can give you the microphone. Yeah. Hello, thank you for a riveting discussion to the whole panel. Um, and it takes one back to one's old, own tree moments, as it were, in a variety of ways, which I won't bore you with. But what I'm really struck with is the, uh, you know, the idea that, which Richard, you know, began with of co-evolution of animals and including humans as animals and trees and how trees would survive without them, but animals and humans would not. And so I thought to myself, okay, at one level, this is a relationship of extraordinary dependence. On the other hand, uh, when you think of the afterlife of trees, no longer as oxygen providers, but as providing the entire infrastructure, hmm, uh, this is the afterlife of trees. This is when, so, so trees then seem to have an almost sacrificial existence. I mean, in addition to all the other forms that you've all pointed out. So I wondered if you had something to say about that, because this is an unequal dependence at one level and a totally crucial one at another. You know, there's a huge paradox there that, you know, the, 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 the humans depend on the living tree and the afterlife of the tree. But the tree or trees in any form have no agential rule role in what happens in their afterlife, whether as fossils or wood or whatever feeds our desires. Um, thanks, Kum Kum. Uh, I think trees, to call them, you know, sacrificial is right, but it's also they're the victims of a tremendous holocaust. Um, you know, to think about the deforestation that's happened in this continent uh, in particular, but also obviously South America and the rainforest and really anywhere where there's uh, forests that can be turned into useful commodities. So in that respect, um, yeah, it's more than a... It, it, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Somebody's phone is talking. Is that Mark? No. no. Um, so it's very uh, bizarre. <laughs> but the other thing I would say, in terms of trees' uh, agentiality, one of the interesting things is uh, in the work that's being done by Suzanne Samard and others, and especially her graduate students and former students, is to look at the way in which trees do have a kind of agency. Her her book is called The Mother Tree. Um, that I put the slide up there. And one of the things that she's discovered is that uh, trees, uh, A, recognize their own kin or seem to recognize their own kin. And to in these um, mycorrhizal networks and these that connect the tree roots and the fungal networks, that they give preference to uh, trees that have come from them, that, you know, their seeds and things like that. I mean, I don't, I don't love the give preference kind of language or that the trees shout out language because I do, I, it's a little bit, 
I mean, there's a kind of anthropomorphism that I think we need to be careful about, although it is one way that we can respect trees and think of them as, you know, as equal humans. So there's that. But the other thing is that um, as these trees are dying, these mother trees, they they do then especially uh, give their uh, their nourishment, their nutrients to uh, their kin. And I really like that idea of um, trees having a kind of uh, sense of their future or something like that. It's a kind of, that's a form of sacrifice that as they're dying there, rather than uh, using all their nutrients to continue to grow, they start sending more of them underground to uh, other trees. Um, I'm taking that as a personal model um, in my retirement and uh, as and as a grandfather is that I'm really um, I've I've really been thinking about what I'm doing as I'm nearing the let's say last hopefully long chapter of my life as um, emulating trees in terms of wanting to give myself to uh, my kin rather than just continue to work on my own growth and my own flourishing and so forth. So. Yeah. Yeah, we have time. Okay, yeah. that question also has some overlap um, with my work. There's a collaborative, an art collection um, called Cooking Sections that had a show that was called Offsetted. And they researched and wrote about the fact that multi-generation, multi-species environments in some parts of the world uh, are raised and destroyed um, so that factories can be built. And the cost of that, the carbon cost, is offset by planting these popsicle stick trees um, in the city. But what I would say is the other thing that's being sacrificed there is the really important mycorrhizal network in the soil, um, which contains a lot of the carbon that trees are uh, pulling down into the ground. Um, and that is sacrificed um, as well, and it's not replaced. You can't replace um, the multi-species system. Michigan, did you have anything to add? Uh, not really. Okay, <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just, just like us, when we return to the earth, it's we're going to turn into soil. That's the way our ancestors talked of it, and uh, the same thing with trees. When they uh, the, they become dried and standing there, it's like a spirit only, and then it'll eventually fall over and return to the earth and regenerate uh, relatives. And it's a kind of our philosophy, the same thing. <clears throat> Well, I think that's that's time for for this uh, this discussion. We could talk more and more about trees, and we invite you to talk more about trees upstairs on the ninth floor. And I'll um, have the MC go back to Anne with full circle. I just I just want to say thank a thank you again to the whole C two one team who put a lot into setting all of this up, and to this team for a very generous. Uh, networked conversation, which I think was really uh, fascinating. Um, also, if there's any materials that we can share, we can share them um, in the on the C21 on the interactive book club that we have. Um, so Nicole will follow up to make sure she can we can share some of the material. I also want to add that as what we call the tectonic shifts in the university of the reorganizing of the humanities itself in the, the future of the humanities. I reread that um, talk in preparation for today that um, we think about how we can mirror the, the structures of trees in the way we organize our own knowledges in the humanities itself. And what would that look like? I think that's a really interesting question as well. Um, I want to invite you to come upstairs. Uh, we have um, a little tree up there, which I promise I went home today and the birch had fallen, a big branch had fallen. I did not cut this branch. Do not be horrified upstairs, but it's a perfect uh, little display uh, in, in the Gallup seminar room. Um, come up, have a glass of uh, something delicious and a little uh, treat that Nicole prepared so lovingly. 
and um, raise a glass to uh, Richard and the legacy he built at the center um, in his own um, next adventure. I won't say retirement because that's a, 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 a an antiquated word. <laughs> So thank you again um, to everyone and come join us upstairs. Um, I really um, am, was moved by today and hope it's informal conversation will be an opportunity to continue the conversation. Thank you.